I, I do want to say uh, that one of that being here, I really appreciate all of you being here, and that generator is one of the things I'm most proud of in my life, and my kids are my other one, and I'm very blessed to have Gabe here, and thank you, you graduated. That's awesome. <laughs> Just had to do that. I, you know, you're, when you get when you get a chance to embarrass your kids publicly, you should not miss. So I am really excited. I don't know where this is going to go. I'm going to be listening just as carefully as you are. I'm not exactly sure. But what I know I was supposed to talk about was the Internet of Things. And I wasn't quite sure how deep or high to go, because how many of you work in the Internet of Things? Oh, geez, I'm screwed. OK, <laughs> so, um, so we're going to talk. I'm going to talk at sort of philosophical. I'm going to talk at a high level. And please feel free to interrupt, or we can talk afterwards. i got lots of toys maybe even a demo, depending on how it goes. I probably got twice as much material as I should do. So I'm going to look for some people nodding off, and then I'll stop, OK? So I want to talk a little bit uh, on the philosophical part. So I want to kind of break this to you. I, I'm an old guy, and um, I don't, you know, and I am kind of a nerd. Um, how many nerds do we have? I, I, I got to feel that like I'm in pretty good <laughs> Oh, we've got four nerds? Come on. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Well, and by the way, these are IoT wirelessly controlled that we've probably come back to. But the, the great thing about this is that I have been around for a while. I've been in IBM. I'm going to try not to make this a sales pitch, so I hope not to mention IBM. Did I just say IBM? Oh, my god, I said IBM again. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it. But I'm going to talk about a little bit of my observations from being in this industry for about 40 years. So I want to introduce you to a couple of other people before I go. The first that I would like to introduce you to is my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, Gabe's grandfather, Gabe Mariano. He was hired. He was also at IBM. He was hired right out of high school, sent to IBM College, and actually worked on these incredibly cool machines. And so he worked at IBM for about 36 years. I'm, I'm also almost 37, so 36 years. And he worked on these crazy things. It turns out just oddly, he spent a lot of time up in Vermont before we moved here going to the Barry quarries to make these giant machines out of granite that were used to make the packages for our early computers. He could make everything. But in the course of his 36 years, Things changed a lot. I'm going to talk a little bit about disruption. I want to talk about how things change. But he loved making things. And one of the things that he made that I really like is my wife, Diane. <laughs> and she worked at IBM for about eight years. Now she's a yoga teacher, a very good one, and a, a beautiful person. But the reason I'm introducing that is, while I think about what else I'm going to say, is that between us, we've worked in for the same company and for the same industry for 80 years, 80 years. And that is a long time. How many of you worked at your company for 80 years? <laughs> I knew you were talking about that. But it, it's given me some perspective, and, the, and I'll get to the IoT eventually. But I wanted to say that I spent a I had, you know, kind of looking back, one of the things that was really fun, one of the messages, and it was actually a talk I had to give it at my kid's school uh, that was kind of you know, you, it's really interesting. You know, I'll never see most of you again. I know a lot of you in here. But if you're going to suck, you don't want to suck in front of your kid's school. And I had to figure out, well, what was I going to say? You know, you, do you remember, like, sitting on a, a bench and having some old guy or old woman up there going, when I was your age? And I was suddenly that person. I was like, what am I going to say? And I realized one message, and if you take away nothing else, that I look back on is the importance of a playful spirit, you know, just actually making your play and your work interchangeable. And that is so easy to say and so hard to do because, you know, work is called work because it feels like work. And if you let the play get choked out of it, and that happens to me all the time, uh, if you let that completely go, you're really in bad shape. But the great thing about, like, the spirit of the maker movement, generator and everything, it's all about play. And when I look back on almost 40 years of working, the things that I enjoyed the most, and not just me, but my colleagues, I worked on video games. Any video gamers of the kind of a PlayStation, let's see, PlayStation 3, uh, no, that's PlayStation 3, 
Xbox 360, uh, Nintendo Wii. I worked on all of those things, and they, even the, the game, that, the, the big chip that was done for IBM Watson. I said IBM again. Okay, every time you say IBM, you can tell me to, not a sales thing. No, it's not a bad place. It's just I'm not trying to do a sales thing. But I worked on chips for almost, for over 30 years. And what that gave me is kind of a perspective. So uh, the, oh, in 2011, my company, so I didn't say it there, turned 100 years old. And that's a big deal. And because I was the oldest and funniest looking employee in this state, <laughs> it's true, provably, I had, to go, I had to go and talk to everybody. And I get to talk to our, uh, you know, our senators and our governor and stuff. And there was a big thing in the free press. And I was holding some wafer looking kind of grizzled. And underneath it, it said 100 years. Do you remember Jim Douglas? <laughs> Jim Douglas, I was at a party with Jim Douglas at Echo, actually, and I was there at Echo, and, and he kind of looked at me, and he goes, I didn't even think you were 90. And I was like, oh. But it was weird. But we're going to get to IoT. The interesting thing, though, is part of that 100-year celebration is I actually was trying to figure out what had happened in the industry. So I actually did some data stuff. I'm a data guy. And I looked at, my big thing was, I'm a computer engineer. I didn't even know what a computer engineer was. And I ended up, when I got my degree, I got a PhD, and it said computer engineering. I said, I'm an electrical engineer. And they said, oh, do you check the wrong box? You're a computer engineer. <laughs> this is true story, totally true story. And um, a computer engineer, evidently, <laughs> I learned, uh, looks at how you turn sand into computers. And so we were trying to figure out what, how much computing you could buy for $1,000, adjusted for inflation and stuff like that, over 100 years. And it was really pretty interesting, because you know, when you started out, you know, my company, I, I keep talking about my company. I like my company. But we started making, like, you know what IBM used to make? Meat grinders, scales, meat grinders. Still feels like meat grinder. But it's meat grinders and mechanical things. And then we started doing uh, computing that was done on mechanical things, like. Okay, if cheese is three cents a pound, you know how, and you got three pounds of cheese, anybody good with math, you know, nine cents? Yeah. So it would go, so we started doing computation, and as did everybody else in the industry. So we did mechanical computing, and then you realize, well, you can only turn the crank so fast, let's put a motor on it, like the Mach 5 computer in 1943 that could do 50 10 digit number multiplications per second. Yeah. But you had to wear ear, ear plugs because it was, had this huge motor. And then, you know, vacuum tubes, that's what I learned in college. Any vacuum tubers here? The old, oh God, oh. <laughs> where's, where's my wheelchair? Um, so, uh, and then, you know, discrete transistors, bipolar integrated circuits, integrated circuits, blah, 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 blah. So this is basically how much computation you can get for a thousand bucks. And that looks like, oh my God. So, I mean, if you, you've heard of Moore's law, right? So Moore's law is about here, here to here. And it's kind of over, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, that looks like a pretty smooth curve, right? That's pretty nice. Well, you know what? It's totally not. It's actually like lots of these kind of smooth like things like this, and then these kind of, oh, shit. Uh, I'm not supposed to say shit. Uh, oh, <laughs> dang. Oh, darn <laughs> movements where, where actually something would, get, would work, and then it would stop working because something happened. Either something new came on that was better, but more often it was something stopped working, you know, like, well, you could only turn the crank so fast, or wait, you could only, you know, the motor would start to wear out, or, uh, you know, actually I was here, and when we were doing these transistor, bipolar transistor chips, they would go faster and faster and faster, uh, but they would catch fire and melt, and that was considered to be, like, not a great sales <laughs> thing. And, but, but the cool thing about that is that you see, you see like it would kind of keep going up and they would be saying, oh, the next one's gonna be so great. But then there was this kind of like leap where all of a sudden you had to go lower. And like we ended up having to switch technology to something called CMOS and it was like, go try selling that. Oh, the next kind of computers you can't wait is gonna be great, they're slower, but, and they're more expensive, but you'll love them. But the point is, <laughs> But, but this was the disruption, the idea that you, you kind of come up with these things that kind of worked for a while, and then you got to know when to leap, when to go to the next thing. And the people who kind of, like the companies that sort of waited around to say, well, we'll see how that works out. Like, 
computer companies like Honeywell, Xerox, Bull, you know, you think about those companies like, they don't make computers. Well, they did. But the funny thing is, is that companies, you know, like my company, I was proud to say we were able to make that leap. But sometimes people come in from totally different ways, like uh, there's this company, Amaz Amazon and, and Goggle, and, and they're kind of like come in, they go, well, people don't want to buy computers anymore. They want to buy s cloud or something. And so if you're the last one waiting there, you're probably in, you're probably in, in deep silicon. And if you're the first one, you might be you know, a pile of bones at the bottom. But the whole idea of how do these disruptions happen and when is the time to leap is very interesting. And believe it or not, I'm going to make this work out for, for IoT. Because there are many cases in industry. Do you guys read, you know The Economist? Do you read The Economist? Nobody really reads The Economist. <laughs> I, I actually used to get it. And then I would fall asleep in the bathtub and drop it. So they did, they did two studies I'll share you on. One was on airplane travel. Same 100 years, which is kind of interesting. That seems to be the, the theme. And it turns out that airplanes from about 1900, depending on whether you believe the Americans or the Russians invented it, you know, the thing until about the early 19, 1960s was how fast an airplane went. It was pr props, mo you know, piston props and turbo props and then then jets and ram jets and blah, 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 blah. And you can tell that somebody kind of, some men and women in Toulouse, France, probably, were drinking some fine wine. And they said, ah, oh, you know, if we just make this airplane. I'm sorry, making, you should never make accents. I work, I work in a foreign country, and they, I work in Germany. We'll tell you more about that. And you don't ever want to make fun of somebody else's accent, because when they make, but you know, they kind of like put a line there and said, you know, if we make that jet that goes faster than the speed of sound, we're going to be rich. How many of you have been on a Concorde? There's always somebody. Alan. Alan must have gone on a Concorde. No? Uh, no, but nobody goes on the Concorde because there were seven of them built, six of them still around, and it turned out that something changed. It was that, you know, it was the econ economics because at some point you're like less than two movies from New York to London and it's just not worth it. But it was very interesting because the, the Economist did another one of these things about like when is the right time to make the leap and when is the time to hold on to what you're doing. And they did it on, this was interesting, this was about um, this. It's a, it's a device that's used to take the hair off your face. <laughs> I am glad to be seen with a bunch of hirsute gentlemen that uh, it's not completely, uh, but the whole idea is that this was a great business model. The guy, Gillette, came up with this cool idea. He didn't use plastic. He had this really sexy kind of handle. He gave it to you, and then you paid for the razor blades. And that worked until about 1998, which was pretty cool. And then what happened was this crazy thing where their, their competitor went to a two-track. They said, well, if one blade was good, two was better. They came back with three blade, which was the fusion. Then there was the wonderful quattro. Then they came out with the, the um, few, uh, no, let's see. Uh, what was it called? No, it was, this was the fusion. That's right. This was the fusion, five blades. And the economist was trying to figure out at what point does it make sense from a disruption to disrupt yourself. And they had calculated the curve, and it was 14. <laughs> so the point is that disruptions happen when something new, either something stops working or something new happens. Now, this is supposed to be a talk about Internet of Things, so I should probably pivot to talk about that because I had no experience with it. I didn't even know how to spell. Do you know what Internet of Things? How many people know about the Internet of Things? I am so screwed. Okay, but, you know, IoT, right? I didn't even know how to spell IoT, but I knew a lot about chips, and what was happening the disruption was not things stopping working. It was all of a sudden a bunch of things coming together. In the case of uh, Internet of Things, it was, it was three things, one of which I sort of knew about. One was really cheap hardware. So the idea, it's interesting because most of, most of silicon hardware, I've got a bunch of chips over there that we can talk about afterwards when we're milling around and, and uh, if you guys will still want to talk to me. But um, the idea is that chips get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And most of, you know what drives electronics more than anything? Well, it's actually not just electronics, because it's the second thing. 
electronics, cheap electronics, and connectivity. What drives that? Entertainment, video games, the fact that, how many of you ever done Pokemon Go or, or Candy Crush or, come on, do that. Or even maybe less savory things, but entertainment <laughs> has drawn, has driven more in the way of silicon and bandwidth. So my entire industry is due to bad choices of time management on the part of everyone. Because that is driven, that is what's driven 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, all of that stuff. That is what's driven silicon costs down. So inexpensive hardware, connectivity everywhere, except perhaps northeastern Vermont, and um, unlimited computing. The idea that you know computing, you no longer have to own a computer, you can have a cloud. That is the disruption, which is Internet of Things. What that allows you to do is to take wicked cheap, can I say wicked cheap? Yeah, I can say that. Wicked cheap stuff and be able to take the data from it connectivity to connect anywhere in the world to almost as much computing as you can afford, like you know any, any kind of cloud kind of computing. The cool thing is that it also allows you to take the brains of something like this, like the ability to understand human language or what's normal and not normal, and kind of squirt it down through the connection into something as cheap, whether it's a toy or anything like that. We'll talk about what's IoT. Why is this a big deal? Because about now, like kind of this year, there's about 9 billion Internet of Things devices, if you count things like cell phones. And there's about, how many people are in the world? 7 billion? Some? So everybody's got more than their share. But there was a projection from these uh, analysts that says that by 2020, they were saying there's going to be 20 billion connected devices. Includes cars, refrigerators, we'll talk about that. But you know what's funny? I spend a lot of time trying to make analysts happy. These are the people who write stuff about you and then if they write something good, you get rich. If you, they write something bad, you go look for a job. And that number has actually been up, you know, it's one of these like, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. It's now starting to happen so much that they actually have now said that there's gonna be about 30 billion devices hooked up. We'll talk about what kind of devices those are by 2020. And if that isn't interesting to you, the fact that that translates on the low side to $4 trillion to maybe $11 trillion in net new you know, uh, uh, value to the global economy, that's amazing. I don't know how they calculate it, but that is more than I make in a week. It's really, <laughs> that's a lot of money. So this, the idea, and we'll talk about, well, how do you translate that in there? Well, the point is, is that it actually, I promised to put some of my family members in here. It's gonna, you know, IOT, do, do you guys have a sense of what devices are kind of IOT? Shout them out. Thermophone, cell phone, yeah, cell phone, that depends, it depends. Who gets the money, huh? Yeah. Oh, we're gonna talk about smartwatches. Are you a parent? Oh, okay. Well, we're going to look for... Okay. Well, we'll talk about those. But these... Huh? Thermostats. Thermostats. There you go. They're all over the place. We'll talk about those. But it turns out that it's going to be very pervasive. And it's going to be because things are getting so cheap that the point of being able to put... It's going to be so cheap to make something connected that you might as well do it. And we're going to talk about Is that always a good decision or not? We're, so I will tell you right now that this talk because I didn't know what I really wanted to say, is full of moral ambiguity. So we'll talk about what's good and what's not good, and you can decide. But I will tell you that of these three lovely ladies, two of them are IoT enabled, like with this veterinary. And I tell you that my lovely bride, Diane, has been resisting. But, <laughs> but these, are, this is a, these are getting really small. I swear you. Okay, so I had a uh, little bit of kind of open mic here is I actually had a, every five years I get a stress test because I have a family history of heart disease and stuff like that. And the guy said, well, you know what we might want to do is we might want to install a little chip in you that monitors you all the time. And I said, do it. <laughs> and he said, well, we got to look at the, I said, do it. I want it now because I have this talk to give. But, but he didn't. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. But anyway, the whole idea is that the, the fact that these things are getting so small, how small? Ask how small? How small? Yeah. Well, it turns out that what's happening, you know about Moore's Law. The whole idea with Moore's Law in, in seven seconds is 
things get smaller, they get faster, and they get lower power. So that's what's driven everything about microelectronics. It's what I bought my house with. It's, you know, it's, it's basically things get smaller, amazingly so. And it turns out that most of that stuff of getting smaller was to build bigger computers. Well, it turns out if you start building, when I say smaller, so there's a, a, the last chip I worked on had six billion transistors on it. And the idea is to make the transistors as small as possible without getting into it um, when the mommy transistor and the daddy transistor love each other very much. No, but basically you have a, you have a, a, a source and a gate, a, a drain, and the closer you can make them, the smaller the transistor, the more you can put on there, and the faster it goes with a lower power. Okay, but if you take that same thing and you say, instead of trying to make a big computer that's cheaper, what if I make the smallest computer? My colleagues at that nameless big company are making the world's smallest computer. This is a tiny test, a test chip, but this, we're now making them. They're about a grain of salt. It has 100,000 gates, so 600,000 transistors. It has a, uh, a microprocessor on it, a radio, enough crypto to make it somewhat safe. Somewhat safe is about as good as you can get. And the, the idea that you're going to be able to put something like that together for three cents, you're going to be able to put these kind of chips in everything. Food wrappers, you're going to be able to put them in, in food. And not to think about it too much, but that's pretty inert. And you wouldn't know, well, you don't have to reuse them. <laughs> so, so that's driving an awful lot of cool stuff. Now, that's what IoT is, and we're going to talk about some use cases. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the intersection of IoT and uh, artificial intelligence. I was told, what, 20 minutes ago, where's Ms. Delabrere, uh, that I had also said something about a blockchain. So I didn't have that in the talk, so I quickly added it. Let's see if I can make that work. But the problem is this. Okay, from a disruption, you know, we were talking about disruption when something stops working and then you got to kind of lean into it and decide when you're going to leap. The same is true about your career. So the problem is, is that I wanted to go work in this IoT thing. And like I said, I didn't even know how to spell IoT. I had done 30 years of doing chips for like video games. I knew, I knew a lot about chips, but it was becoming, you know, after one, one second rule, first rule is you gotta learn to play and keep that in your job. Second rule is you should change jobs every 30 years, okay? <laughs> But I was there, I was, I seriously, I'd been working there 30 years and I wanted to show up at this new organization and say, I wanna work there. And I'm pretty senior, so I couldn't like start at the bottom and learn my way up. So I was like, what do I show them? I mean, nobody knew what IoT is. I would argue that not that many people really know what it is now. And this is a point that I'm talking to my, my friends here. You're all makers, how many makers? Good, you're in this room, that counts. You know what got me my job was goofing around, and it had to do, so it was the stuff that I made for fun. So this is a, uh, everything I make is seven meters tall. This is a seven meter tall, um, it's a device. Well, so let me explain a little bit. I went to, as an undergraduate, I went to MIT in Cambridge, and I work there now, actually, which is a long story, but. Um, so there's a Vermont, any MIT people? Oh. Okay, I'm done. No, but they're the Vermont's Vermont own Vermont's own MIT club is Vomit Vermont's own MIT club, and and the um, Haunted Forest. Have you ever been to the Haunted Forest? So they came to us and they said, Vomit, we need some way of converting electrical energy into something that will scare the you know what out of kids. And I was like, that is a good use of an engineering education. So we built this thing that kind of went from two meters to seven meters tall, and it would jump up, and it would kind of like, so that's, you see me there. Um, so it was really cool, because you could actually measure spontaneous urination, you could do all the math, and it was really fun. And this thing had been, it was beat. It's still there, it's been rebuilt twice. But the whole idea of being able to create a radio-controlled thing that scares the hell out of people was, I thought, a pretty good use of an engineering degree. You can see when you talk into the microphone, it's so this was good. So I had this kind of portfolio, again, made with vomit and, um, and with a bunch of students from local, uh, local high schools. And uh, another thing, um, I don't even know how to describe this, also seven meters tall, but it's um, a carousel thing for driving half-naked hippies across a 
desert? Yeah. Well, anyway, but basically, that's my brother. That's Uncle Billy. Um, but uh, basically, we did the lighting and the controls and stuff like that wirelessly, which is basically Internet of Things. So by converting the stuff that I really like doing, I'm not kidding, though it sounds like I'm kidding, I went and I said, well, I don't know much about IoT, but I've built these things. I know how to control things wirelessly and read data from wireless. And they said, you're hired. Not only that, you're the boss. And so what happened is we were creating in Three, two and a half years ago, uh, this is where I work. This is the Munich IoT Center. This is our headquarters for my division. I am the boss, which scares the you know what out of me. And um, basically, it was like, you know, um, I, uh, people ask me where I live, and I say I average south of Iceland, which is true. I kind of work there every, every other week and then come back, though I'm, I'm transitioning. I'm actually going to be moving closer to home, which is great. Uh, but this was really fun because this is, it's, a, it's a great facility and we were setting up shop and the whole idea was to how do we enable Internet of Things? And we'll talk about what kinds of things, but this is where I work. This is my, that's my friend Jorn. <laughs> but, uh, but you get sort of a sense, uh, actually we have a, if we get down the other place, you'll be able to see that uh, We've got a little uh, laser, we got a little maker space that uh, this place was kind of the, um, here, let me see, and I can, it's also kind of a, um, yeah, keep going. So this is a, this is the, the this is the uh, data coming out of the machine, out of the building right now. So we've installed over a thousand sensors. Ah, that's just so annoying. Um, We've, we've installed about a thousand sensors there, and uh, there were several people who I talked to before the, the, um, ow, shut up. Um, so part of my job is to, to try to figure out how to demonstrate what we're actually doing in a fun and useful way, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But smarter buildings, how many smarter buildings people are? I think there, there's a connection, I, oh wow. Okay, there were a couple of people I wanted to connect with that. But yeah, whatever. Um, having lots of data, so the basic progression is you collect a lot of data because that's what you think IoT is about. And then you sit around and go, what can we do with this? And I'm gonna talk a little bit of that. How many of you have been in that position? Hey, I just spent a lot of money collect, oh. <laughs> That is a sales pitch, that's great. So you collect a lot of data. So I have that sound thing, that actually is the sound of people walking around the building, it's the sound levels, it's the CO2 levels, it's the uh, temperature, it's um, the, whether the bus is coming, it's how many people are in the lunch line, it's whether somebody's tweeting about the building positively or negatively. And you know what, I actually meditate to that and I can tell when something's wrong. I can't really tell what it's doing, but I can go, Nobody's tweeting about my building. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. But, but let's talk about what, so, so that's my history. Yes? Do you have the sound coded for uh, what information's coming in? I do. I know exactly what it is, and I don't care. Yeah, I do. Yeah, actually, you can, you can really tell. But the whole idea is, what is that data telling you, and why does it matter? Because a lot of people in IoT spend a lot of money saying, you know, if we just get this data, it'll be great. And I can tell you that your, your desk temperature is 24.2 degrees centigrade. So what? So that's the whole thing. There's this so what part right now of what can we do that's really interesting, that's essential. And that's what's pretty interesting. But let's talk about what Internet of Things is. Now, most people know we had that shout out a little bit, but so we had some fitness people, you know, We'll talk about these fitness devices. How many people have fitness devices? Okay, well, let's talk about that in a second, huh? An iPhone counts. An iPhone counts, yes. Yes, especially in this case. So, you know, there are things like fitness devices, personal devices, there are uh, digital assistants, like this one, which is dangerously close to my Tesla coil. Ouch, shit, uh, soup, excuse me. Uh, the brand B one. There are things like Utensils. How many of you have IoT enabled? How many of you have IoT speakers like Alexa? Am I allowed to say Alexa? Yeah. How uh, Google Home? Some off-brand thing? Homemade? 
Yes! I knew it, Eric. But this is what people typically think about what IoT is, and this is what we call consumer IoT. And you know what? I don't work in consumer IoT. It's incredibly important. I mean, I think things like Amazon Alexa are an amazing invention because I didn't know what it was, and now I can't live without it. So that's an amazing essential. Is it essential? I don't think it's essential, but how else can you stand in your front yard and yell that your light should turn off? I mean, I didn't know I needed to do that, but I needed to do that. But it turns out that a lot of what, you know, there's a lot of people, my mother, for example. Do you guys know my mother? You know my mother. You do know my mother. I tried to fix you up with my mother. Yeah, I did. I was serious. Um, but um, it turns out that a lot of people are asking, do you, do you know what the, the, the Gartner hype curve is? There's this stuff where there's like the expectations are building, are building, building. IoT is right at the peak of that. And the idea is that now it goes into what's called the trough of dissolution where people go, what were we thinking? This is useless. And then it comes out and it finds its own level. IoT is right at that peak where people are going, well, we'll talk about that. Not every IoT is a good IO, uh, idea. But it turns out that IoT is already adding a lot of value where you might not believe it. Now, I'm going to talk, again, I don't mean this to be a sales pitch, but I will tell you about what I know. Have you ever heard of Starbucks coffee? So every Starbucks you go into, I control. No, I don't really control. I help them manage their leases and whether their machines are well maintained and stuff like that. But it turns out that, that many companies, that buildings are really, uh, you know, buildings have been connected for zillions of years, but now they're starting to get smart about, you know, how many people are using that building? Does that Starbucks get as many people as the other one? And being able to tell that real time. So the idea of being able to instrument those things so that all of those fancy machines and all those baristas with attitude are instrumented properly so you can tell, you know, are you making good business decisions? That's a use of IoT. Um, industrial robotics. I do a lot of stuff with industrial robotics. I have all these crazy robots flying around. And the idea is, how do you actually make robots that are flexible enough to be able to do one job one day and another job the other day? And how do you learn if you have... I went to a place in China that had 100,000 robots. And how does this robot know what that one learned? That's using IoT and, and artificial intelligence. Airplanes. Anybody ever been on an airplane? <laughs> yeah. So airplanes have been actually IoT devices for longer than just about anything. Um, uh, an Airbus is a, uh, can I say this? Yeah. So another one of my clients, um, an A380. Uh, do you know if you're flying from London, let's say you're flying from New York to London, how many seconds do you think somebody has to be driving? 45 seconds. And that is legal because, I mean, that's not, that, that's, that's the minimum. Because when you're taking off, a human really, really, really needs to make the decision like, is this a good idea? And, but for the rest of the time, if you're not careful, it gets really boring. We have good friends who, who, are, who fly for Air France. And it turns out that all of that stuff is automated. The thing can take off and land by itself. Legally, it has to have somebody's hands on it when it's taking off. But there's a lot of things that come up, unexpected things, where somebody has to be engaged. But for the most part, it's automated. And it's because a lot of the intelligence is on the plane, a lot of the intelligence is back home. As a matter of fact, an A380 takes about you know, the motors, the engines, that are, I think those are Rolls-Royce. I think they're Rolls-Royce engines. But the A380 has four engines, 640 terabytes going from New York to London. And most of that, that's too much data to beam down. So most of it's just recorded and nobody ever looks at it. Or you hope nobody ever looks at it. You know, That's not funny. <laughs> I, I flew 300,000 miles last year. But the whole idea is more and more that data is being beamed down to actually improve the outcomes. Because the whole idea is you want to convert this. Right now, these engines are taken down every 10,000 hours, and they're completely rebuilt. But you, you obviously can't afford to do it too little. 
But if you do it too much, you're just spending extra money. So the idea is to be able to listen, as it were, and I'll talk about that in a second, to the, the, the engine and try to predict when it needs repair before it needs repair, especially airplanes. Airplanes are a good thing to fix before they need a problem. But things like trains, SNCF, the big, have you ever been on the train TGI? TGI one is, thank goodness it's Friday, one is the French train TGIV, Tan Great Train Grand Velocité, yeah, whatever. But these things go 300 kilometers an hour, and we help them measure the, you know, every train that goes by is measuring the accuracy of the pitch of the train. And the whole speed thing is determined by how smooth you can make it. And so by getting data from that, so there's vibration sensors, we're able to get the trains not only to be able to maintain the tracks, but the trains can share from each other like, whoa, some kid put a, you know, a penny on that or whatever they use in France, you know, a centime, you know, yeah, exactly, or saltine. And so basically that's actually being used. And another thing, we do automotive. So um, we bought a car today, and it actually had telemetry in it. How many of you have cars that are connected to the internet? How many of you know if you have cars? Most cars, if you bought a car in the last year and a half, and it was cost, it was fairly high-end car, or, you know, medium-level car, it has a telemetry system in it that uses cell phones to be able, do you remember that irritating, most cars still have it, the irritating red light that says, check engine, and that might mean, oh, you know, sometime in the next six months, you should go get this tuned up. It also might mean the car is about to explode. You should run for your life, and you don't really know, right? But it turns out that Internet of Things, like Tesla is a big client of ours, and they don't give us all Teslas to drive, which kind of sucks. But the idea of how do they design these cars so that they actually meet constraints, and how do you measure the data from the cars we don't actually do the data telemetry on Tesla, but we do the design part. How do you actually measure that so that when the red light comes on, not only do you know whether it's important or not, and you can text, you can interact with the, d the driver and say, you know, she or he, you better go do this now, or, but you can also schedule the, the repair and you can have the part there. And what we are involved in is that the next level can be designed so that it's not gonna fail. So you get this data. Right now, the only thing that they can do is they look at the data after the fact, right? Now we can look at it real time. But it's not all stuff like that. This is my favorite one. We also have rhinoceri. So basically, IoT can be used for all things. Let me this endangered you. species is getting help from some unexpected friends, the so, zebra and antelope. They're wearing right? IoT sensors down? connected to the IBM cloud. Okay. When poachers enter the area, the animals run for it, which alerts rangers who can track the Internet their of things. and help stop them before it So uh, I helped my friend Marcus uh, with a project where what we're trying to do is stop poaching in, in uh, Namibia and South Africa. And what we were doing is um, it turns out that putting collars on rhinoceri, rhinoceri? is a hard thing. But it turns out that zebras hang out near rhinoceroses, and the poachers scare the zebras. So we've been using LoRa. How many LoRa fans? We've got a bunch of LoRa fans. Ooh, check it out. So we've been using LoRa networks. So we built a large LoRa network to go monitor these zebras. And we then use artificial intelligence to figure out whether, you know, what, you know, whether something is spooking the herd. And then they can actually send in the, the, the people to figure out whether they gotta go with a shovel or a gun or whatever. But it turns out really weird because you can actually look at this data and we've actually, unfortunately, been able to find times we couldn't get there. We can tell exactly what's happening and we're, what are we, 9,000 miles away. But IoT really can be anything. Have you ever been in the, uh, so this is in Prague and this is a great sculpture. This is one of the things that was really nice because we'll talk in just a second about an IoT project here in, in, in Burlington. But this is a project that you, um, you use your cell phone and you can text it there. And they will, um, this is the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia before it was uh, split in two. And this uh, it uses, it will, you text it some text and it writes your, it writes your text in the water uh, and without a pencil. <laughs> it's IoT, okay, IOP, IOP. 
and, and this kind of brings up a point, because you know, when I was talking about the Gartner curve, is it's not always, it's not always good. Not everything that people come up with with IoT is necessary. The, the, the actual, you know, archetypical, not very useful IoT device is the IoT toaster. If you go up, it is a meme, it is so bad. Do you really need a toaster that burns your, well, we actually do have a toaster that burns our face into the toast, but it, this will actually burn the weather into your toast. And this is a real thing. There are so many articles and there's a big bunch of memes about, does anybody need that? Or do you need an IoT connected salt shaker? Maybe you're using too much, you know, or an IoT connected toilet? You know, you might want to, there's, there's this thing called the, what is it, the, the, worried, the worried well. People who really want to, the quantified self, people really want to know that stuff. And if I, this is the eye condom, don't ask. Okay, but um, <laughs> this one was really interesting because this was actually something I had involved with. Several companies have this. How many of you have babies or have had babies? Or how many have been babies? Okay, right. So it turns out that, you know, moms and dads kind of can tell when Junior needs to be changed. But in the world of the quantified self, you want some prior warning so you can tell if the baby is wet. And it turns out that making the baby, just finding out if the baby is wet, it turns out that urine is a, an electrolyte. You know, it's got lots of salts in it. It conducts electricity. Uh, you know, we work with companies I can't say the names because that's not, but big diaper companies, and you can make something that will tell you, you know, send you a text message when your baby's wet. The, the baby could probably use the iPad and send you a message. But it turns out that it's harder to figure out if the, the diaper is dirty, and it turns out that there's been all these things using mass spectroscopy and stuff like that, and I was brainstorming with a client, and I said, I don't know how to do it affordingly, but I have a great title for it. Not Fitbit. <laughs> and the weird thing is, they like the name, but they'd already made the thing with the scent in it. I'm not kidding. But so some of these things are like, does the world need that? And actually, kind of getting philosophically, you know, do we want the world to know that? about us or our babies or stuff like that. So I think that's an interesting question. How am I doing on time, Chris? Okay. Seriously? Are you guys still with me? Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about what makes IoT IoT because this is the part where I'm going to need I'm going to need a local shout out in a second. But IoT nobody goes into business to say I'm going to be internet of things. It's like saying if you're a programmer, how many programmers it's like saying, I do semicolons, or, you know, <laughs> or I do braces. It's, it, IoT is always about doing something else. And so it's a big stack of stuff. And it starts at the silicon, like I said. It goes to the devices. I have a, a bucket load. I literally have a bucket of mm -hmm. IoT devices. And I'll bet people here have that kind of stuff. Those are connected by a local network to a gateway. And that gateway is becoming increasingly important because a lot of the processing can be done there. That goes up to a global network. That could be LoRa. It could be a cellular network. Um, this could be Wi-Fi somewhere in here. That could be Wi-Fi. It could be Bluetooth. It could also be LoRa. That then goes generally to the cloud where you can actually put processing like, like uh, artificial intelligence up in the cloud. Now, increasingly, a lot of this processing is going to find its way down to the gateway because you don't really want to ship all your data up to the cloud. Maybe it's, it's expensive to ship that data. It's private. It might even be illegal, like if it's health-related data. And then eventually, you got to do something with it and make money. you got to sell it. You know, maybe it's a smart building. Maybe it's a smart automotive. Maybe it's a smart grid. We have people in this room who are doing all of that. But to me, the really cool thing is when you start to add artificial intelligence to it. And it's a really cool area, but it's also really spooky. Well, I don't want to say really spooky. I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to say it's really spooky, but let me just say. Um, but it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's really positive, but we have to think about it. We have to do it responsibly. 
So um, I just want to do a kind of a quick outside thing. That sounds very abstract, but now I'm going to put my friends Eric and AJ on the spot. I mean, IoT could be done in some crazy company in Germany, but IoT is happening right here. And Eric, tell us about the IoT in Burlington. I didn't really tell you I was going to say that, did I? No. Okay, but tell it. Can you tell us, uh, AJ and, and Eric? Can you talk a little bit about the IoT project here in in Burlington? The the IoT. Uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, so you have thirty seven seconds. So what we're trying to figure out is what could we actually do you want to add something, AJ? Yeah, no, I was just gonna bring up, you know, Eric brought up a lot of policy issues mm -hmm. and public safety around traffic, bottlenecks, and all that energy consumption. These are all things that before took a lot of time and effort and money to take care of. Now we're trying to figure out can we collectively figure out what could be the solution here. I think it make it smarter but make it more fun. I will say that at the original charter of this that in addition to doing good and measuring water and everything like that, I did put in two notions that to enable public art, this is a, a Laura radio if you want one, uh, to enable public art and public mischief. So hopefully that's still part of the, uh, that's still part of the thing, right. So anyway, so let's talk a little bit, are, are you guys still with me? Can I keep talking? Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, IoT and where it's going with artificial intelligence. How many artificial intelligence experts do we have? I have a feeling that I'm kind of outnumbered here. But artificial intelligence, I am programmed to respond, is good and very safe. <laughs> now, artificial intelligence is something that's been around for a bazillion years. This guy, Marvin Minsky, who invented the idea of neural networks, his son was dated my roommate in college, and so he used to talk about making these little neural networks that could be able to model a frog's eye. Well, it turned out that that kind of rolled around for about 40 years, no joke, and then all of a sudden, it got possible. And what made it possible? Do you know? Video games, yes, cheap silicon. It turns out that those crazy things that I was working on in the 1990s and 2000s, video game processors, the graphics processor that allowed you to, you know, have a realistic feel as you chopped off the demon's head or whatever other sort of weird entertainment you liked. That, uh, that acceleration is the same acceleration that's necessary for artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence is not a precise word. There's zillions of kinds. There's natural language processing, which is like, how do we talk? It's like Amazon Alexa or Google Home or Watson. There, I said it. Um, you know, so you can talk to it, you can, you know, it can understand you, et cetera. There are things about doing tech, uh, uh, text analytics, like I've got all these instruction manuals, I've got all these laws, I've got all these patents, how do I know what they say? But the thing that's most interesting around, and all of those are useful in IoT, the most interesting thing is something called deep learning, machine learning or deep learning. And deep learning is just the special, coolest kind of machine learning. And machine learning is really basically just figuring out using kind of model of the way that organic that that you know biological systems 
learn and think, just trying to figure out what's going on with something. So IoT is a lot of data coming in, and you want to figure out what's normal, what's not normal, and when it's normal, is it doing X, is it doing Y? You know, these are the kind of things that humans have done or that we've written very, you know, cruddy code to try to figure out, you know, is the temperature too hot? What should I do about it? Is the car about to crash? What should I do about it? And the basic model is really, really elegant. It's based off of, we, you know, engineering is all about copying good design, and the guy that designed this really knew what he was doing because it was based on how animals, like humans, are kind of wired. Basically, neurons in your brain, they have a lot of inputs, and those inputs have different weights. Those weights are tuned by training. The first time you touch a hot stove, you go, ouch. The next time you go, ouch. The next time you go, oh, I'm not gonna touch that, right? So those are actually tuning, uh, you know, multiply it times a trillion. So basically, you have a trillion of these things hooked up into your brain. They're organized, it's not completely flat. Somebody told me that the brain is wired into four major clusters, the four Fs. It's uh, flight, fight, feed, and reproduce. And um, <laughs> so that basically the idea here is that you have these neurons that are clustered together locally. They, they each, so each one of these goes to the output of several of these. And depending on this weight, that sort of says, ah, I'm going to take this input and go to that output. What deep learning, the basic AI, that's what you normally think about when you think of AI, is you give it some input. Like, let's say it's a picture, a picture of a car. And basically, you create a network of these kind of nodes, and there's, it's actually not that many. You know, it might be tens not, or, or low hundreds, more like tens. And that what you're trying to do is you give it an input, and then it tries to tell you, is that a car or is that not a car? It's, uh, the, the magic is in being able to take a zillion pictures, like things, like there are giant databases like ImageNet on the, the interweb, where you have a bunch of pictures, and then they're labeled. That's a car, that's not a car, that's an iguana, that's your third grade Sunday school teacher. You know, you have all this stuff. And if you basically have the picture and you have the answer, you give it to a system like this, and this is like, you all have PhDs at the end of this. No, but basically you, ba you, you give it inputs, you know what the output is. If it gets it right, you give it a food pellet and it basically goes in, and, and uh, increases the weights on those things that had the biggest input to that. If it gets it wrong, you actually do the opposite. You decrease those weights and it takes a tremendous amount of processing, but that's basically what machine learning and deep learning is about. So I probably offended the people who are at, uh, AI people by saying it that simply, but it turns out to be a really almost magical capability. And it turns out that that has been, you know, innovations in the last, I would say, four years, maybe even three years in the open source community, things like TensorFlow from Google, which I super appreciate, PyTorch, et cetera, has made it so that you don't have to have a PhD in, in computer science or data science but you can take data from any sort of data source, whether it's a camera, which is an IoT device, it can be a heating system, it can be a car, et cetera, and you can do all sorts of stuff. Like, I always like to think about how you can actually, IoT plus artificial intelligence is like giving senses, ears, nose, eyes, touch, tongue, you know, taste to a computer and the ability to, to do that in the world. So this is, for example, something we do um, it turns out, have you ever taken, did you ever listen to car talk? Yeah. You know, like they would call in and my car's going, rah, 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 and they'd say, are you sure it's not going, roo, roo, roo. And then, no, it's going, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> well, it turns out that this is, oh, wait, can we hear this? Yeah. So basically, the sound something makes, especially if you know where you're putting the microphone, and you can put it on a, a machine like a wash machine or something, you can tell what's going wrong. If you put it on a car or a motor or anything like that, and then basically you train it, you, you take a wash machine, this is the fun part, you take a wash machine and you, uh, you screw it up, and it says, oh, it's your kid's sock in the pump. And it turns out that that is a really good way to be able, it's, you, there's an incredible amount of information 
in sound, sound, smells, all of that stuff. And all you're, all you're doing is you're giving a computer the ability to be able to recognize for that model, in this weather, that sounds funny. And it's not, it correlates back. And if you think about it, adding a microphone under the hood of a car is a whole lot less expensive than adding a zillion sensors. So we're starting to be able to monitor what's going on in a car, in an airplane engine, in your house. There are a lot of systems out there that actually will monitor whether your house is being broken into or you're having an argument or something like that based on the sound. That's really cool. You can tell the sound of breaking glass. You can sound the sound of a, a TV being kind of moved off of a table. Is that okay? Might be okay. I mean, the benefit is good, but it's also kind of weird. It's always listening to me. That's kind of weird. Here, but privacy, this is the big thing, is that when you're starting to listen or watch. This is a project that I've done in you know, that, that Munich building where I work. One of the things we wanted to figure out is how many people are actually in a room? Like, how many people are here? Can you do a quick estimate? Well, it turns out you can take a camera, and I could look, and I can count them. I can make that happen. But that's kind of creepy, right? I can tell who's here if I look at them. I can tell how many people are guys or girls or Republicans or, you know, you can tell, well, you can't really tell that. But you can tell what, you know, who's in the room. And if you think about it, privacy is an incredibly important topic here. What's going on? So we, we got charged with trying to figure out how many people were in a room without being able to use a camera. And it turned out that we were able to do a simple exercise using machine learning. So we had sensors. I mentioned we had 1,000 sensors in that building. One of them is a very cheap sensor, this thing up here, that actually can monitor movement and it can monitor sound and light. But one of the things that it, two things that it measures is carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe out mostly, right? Or not mostly, but some of. And, and uh, what's called volatile organic compounds, VOCs. So it turns out that your skin, your breath, you know, everything, especially after a hangover, you know, you're breathing this stuff out. And it turns out, we built a machine learning model, a computationally, you know, just like that, that uh, network that I said before. We didn't know what data to use, but we put it all in there, and it taught us something really cool. This is something we're patenting. It said that if you monitor not how much CO2 is in there, but how fast it changes, you've got a really good, so what we did is we put that in there, and then we put a bunch of people, and we paid them to sit in conference rooms for, you know, okay, sit in conference room for a second. And then what happened, this is the CO2 and, and VOC composite level. And it turns out that that slope correlates exactly to how many people are in there. And we did not have to take a picture of anybody. We did not have to know who it was or what they were doing. But we were able to do this. And it was just the exhaust, I mean, literally, the exhaust of the data. So this is a place where AI and IoT. Now, all of a sudden, I know in my building, so we have 11 floors, we have 340 people. I can tell who's, you know, who's uh, ordering a conference room for 15 and showing up with one person to be able to eat their lunch. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, the point is, is how do you actually do something with that data? Um, you can, that's like giving IoT a nose. Uh, what about a taste? This was an experiment we did with Gallo Vineyards. So Gallo makes wine. Maybe not the best wine, but I like it. It's in boxes, and I think the boxes are very attractive. And they have, in Almaden, uh, California, they have these test vineyards where they're testing different grapes, and it was already pretty automated. You know, it could tell if the soil was dry, and it would add more water if the soil was dry, and it was working pretty well. And they gave us a challenge. My friend Hendrik, they said, can you use this artificial intelligence to make me better wine that tastes better? And so what we basically did is we used, how much time? Okay. So we basically used the, the watering here. We looked at satellite data, open data from the, the interweb, and we were able to look at how much water was actually coming off of those leaves. And by doing little bitty experiments and doing machine learning, we were able to adjust precisely how much water each row got. And in just doing that, in about six weeks, we were able to use 25% um, less water and get 15% more sugar. And it's just the adding of information. So it was already automated. It was already watering itself. But that was pretty cool.
Now, where this is going is, you know, you know about automated driving. You've probably seen in the last couple of weeks, there have been a couple of pretty horrific accidents. There was an Uber accident with an automated car. Did you see that? And a Tesla car that drove into things. Well, AI is used, the most kind of canonical AI thing is to look at a camera and figure out, is that LOL cats or is that a burglar? And, you know, the whole idea of you give it a bunch of things and it turns out in an automated car, that's gotten to be, that's gotten a lot of attention. You can tell that something is an obstacle and something is a line. We just bought a car today that can actually, you know, figure out whether you're crossing the line. That's a pretty cool thing. And, in, you know, by 2020 in Germany, where I work, there's going to be li lanes for completely autonomous driving. And we're, not gonna, we're only going to be a couple of years behind that. So that's really cool. You can give it eyes. But here's, here's where it starts to get a little weird. You know, AI, you know, when you start relegating a very important decision, like taking off of an airplane or staying in your lane to a car, to, to a computer, you know, based on AI data that's come, I mean, IoT and AI data that's coming in, you have to trust it. But this is really interesting. Some of the basic technology, we just did a study on bias. So there are these data sets of just random internet pictures of men and women. And what we just found out, just on, just because the mathematics doesn't have, a, it doesn't, it can't explain to you why I chose this. Why did I decide to take a left? Why did I decide to take a right? It's because the data said to. Well, we just did this kind of experiment, and it turns out that if you're a white male, the, the basic standard, industry standard recognition technologies will get you about 99% of the time. This should scare you. If you're a white female, 93%. If you're you know, a, a man of color, 88%. If you're a woman of color, it can be as down as to 65%. Now, why is that? There's no programmer saying, I don't want to recognize those people. It has to do with cultural bias and who takes pictures of what. And, and there's nobody who's intentionally doing that. And therein lies the essential challenge of AI. When you start to trust an artificial intelligence with life or death decisions or value decisions or things like that, you really have to pay attention. So I'm an optimist, but this is something that gets me, I'm spending a lot of time, I'm actually transitioning to work on these things about reliability, explainability, and ethics in AI. But when you're trusting that your car is gonna do the right thing, you know, you've probably all seen these scenarios, you know, do you, do you take a decision? If you have to make a, an immediate decision, do I crash my car or do I crash his car? How do you know that? So I think the whole idea about the, you know, adding the, phys the ability to affect the physical world with AI is where it gets interesting, where it gets really valuable, and where it potentially gets scary. And I would just add that a little bit, you know, in terms of things like privacy. So, and I don't mean to be a downer here, but how many of you have like, we mentioned thermostats. How many of you have like Nest thermostats or something? You know, it's very easy for that AI. That AI knows when you're away. It knows if you've been good or bad. I mean, it's like Santa Claus, right? This thing knows that. And it's pretty interesting how much they know. Now, they're, they're a good company, but there are people. How many of you had fitness devices? How many of you are parents? Ever occur to you that the uh, manufacturing process for humans is identifiable on those devices? <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out that these are also very good companies, but the AI that is trying to figure out, are you getting your, you know, enough steps in, has to intentionally look the other way when you're doing something they don't want to know about. That's interesting. I think in the most part, it's about, there is no technical solution to that. It has to do with ethics. It has to do with teaching men and women who are designing these systems that interact with the physical world, what's right and what's not right. There is no solution, yes? I'm not programmed to respond to that. No, you know what? I, I think it's a really bright line. The person who generates that data owns the data flat out. And that that has to be, there has to be sort of a data bill of rights. You know, in, in Europe, there's the GDPR, the whatever it is, changed my life. But the whole idea, I th and it, it gets to be dicey because when you aggregate data into a learning model like that, that image data, you 
you know, everybody's data contributes to it, but ultimately I think you own your own data, you own the control of it, who can see it, and you have the right to be forgotten. And I think that that's really what it has to be. In Europe, but not in this country. And all I would say is when you go to the voting booth, I am not programmed to respond to anything political, but you should really think, when you think about things like net neutrality, this stuff is going to happen a lot. And we have to be, we have to be activists. You have to be, you know, it, it's really caveat emptor. I mean, when you, this, is, it's, it's, this was in funny times. Do you guys get funny times? I get it sometimes. Sometimes somebody has to explain it to me. But, you know, like your, your Google, you know, your Google Home or your Amazon starts to know about you. This guy's trying to unplug his Amazon or his Google Home, and, it, and then it, the, 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 the blender starts telling on him. It's kind of, you know, you really got to be very, 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 very careful. And I think it, it really comes down to us being responsible. But before I leave you on that kind of a downer, I'm going to say, let's, you know, I, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to switch gears. Because actually, AI can be the best friend we have for security and privacy. It turns out that things, when you try to figure out what's normal, what's not normal, when I have somebody who's spying on my data or listening to my data and I didn't know about it, what's the best way to find that? What's the best way to find a pattern in something? AI. So it turns out that we're spending a lot of time. It's, you know, security and privacy is not a problem you solve. It's something you stay ahead of the bad guys. And the bad guys and the good guys kind of change hats every once in a while. You don't really know. But it turns out that artificial intelligence, even though it can be a privacy problem, it can be the privacy solution. It turns out that knowing when somebody's leaking data or knowing when, this is hard to explain, but it turns out I, we own a lot of um, health data and you redact it, you take out the, the, the private parts about who that was. But if, if, if anybody actually spends a couple of seconds on the interweb figuring out, oh, this person came in with that diagnosis on that date, go look at the newspaper, et cetera, you can actually re de-anonymize things, you can actually take it out. Well, the only way to find out what you can de-anonymize is actually use the same tools that people are using. So basically, and I'm gonna, I, I apologize just because of time, I'm gonna skip the, the blockchain thing that I put in for you guys, Delabrares, and I'm gonna come back to it later. But I will tell you, as I am getting close to the end, so what did I just do? I just told you how great IoT was and how rosy the world was and how much fun it was, but then I think I just scared you of like, oh, that's kind of dangerous. You know, when your things start to know more about you, so what is the truth? Is it good? Is it bad? Is IoT good or is it bad? Is AI good? Is it bad? How many think it's good? How many think it's bad? How many think it's in between and it remains to be seen? There you go. I am a, I am a pragmatic optimist but I think the right thing to do is we have to be active. You actually have to get out there and you have to vote, you have to be informed, and you have to be cautious. And I would say, you remember this thing about the disruptions? This is a disruption. AI plus IoT, and I wanna again say it's, you know, AI by itself, it can do anything at once. If it doesn't have a, whatever it is, the light switch, the car, the gun, you know, it's pretty harmless. When you start putting IoT next to it, that is AI with things. That's when you have to think about it. But would I say we should shut it down? No. It's one of these disruptions. And just like we have that picture here, I would argue that we have that same kind of stuff going on in our life. You know, we have those smooth sailing times and then we have those interconnect things. I mean, for me, it's like, uh, you know, I didn't have to worry about where I got, you know, I had an IBM issued wife. I didn't have to think about that. How many kids I had, they had nothing to do with that. Whether you should get a tattoo of your company in a place you can't show people. You know, sometimes they're your decisions. Sometimes it's not your decision, right? You know, um, one of our sons uh, died 11 years ago, Sam. And, and if, if I can just take a moment to say he was an organ donor. And if, if you could just honor it, if you go to samstones.org, and you spend a, just a couple of minutes thinking about organ donation, talking to the people that you love, I would really appreciate it. But sometimes those things happen and you just have to move through them. I would argue that the stuff about AI is one of those crazy disruptions. It's not good, it's not bad, it's how you actually face these disruptions, how we as individuals, how we as a society. You have to be bold, but cautious. 
And I just want to kind of leave you on a thing, a big lesson that I learned and that I have to always learn. So it was a long story, but it's part of my kind of return into the world after that kind of tragedy. I was sitting there one day, and uh, I, I was trying to figure out how I could use my love of making to kind of get myself back on track. I was sitting there, and I was, went to my beautiful wife, and I said, beautiful wife, I want to do something that matters in the world. I want to work with kids about science. What should I do? And she looked at me, and she goes, I'm cooking. You know, I, I don't have time for this. Go ask the world. <laughs> so, so I went out. And I basically asked the planet, you know, the, the cosmos, you know, what do you have for me? Well, long story is a long story, and I can't tell the whole long story. But basically, um, I got a call the next day from a, a, a recruiter on a reality show and said, do you want to be a scientist? And this is what happened. We're on the edge of a global catastrophic disaster. Human conflict. Nuclear bombs, natural so, disasters. It's not all rosy. Chemical and biological warfare. Without warning, the world as we know it can come to an end. It's the near future. A viral outbreak decimates the world's population. Your home, your workplace, your friends and family, gone. Los Angeles is one of many cities left devastated. Infrastructure breaks down. Chaos reigns. Facebook friend. This is the setting of the colony. The colony is a controlled experiment to see if 10 strangers can rebuild society in the wake of a global catastrophe. The backgrounds and expertise of these 10 volunteers represent a cross-section of modern society. For 10 weeks, they'll be isolated with no electricity from the grid, no running water, and no communication with the outside world. All they'll have to work with are their skills, the tools and supplies inside an abandoned factory, and whatever they can scavenge at a handful of cordoned off locations. As part of the experiment, and 13 stitches. Yeah, 13 stitches. And thugs will challenge the colonists' resources and security. Get him out! The world of the colony has been designed using elements from both historical disasters and models of what the future would look like after a global viral outbreak. The volunteers of the colony have an amazing so, opportunity to teach all of us how to survive after a major disaster. So it was a long story. So. Basically, it was a great maker paradise. We spent 59 days locked in this warehouse just trying to make stuff. It was on Discovery. We, were trying to, we made power generation. We made weapons. It turns out that I mastered in weapons. You know, me, the pacifist, I was really good at making non-lethal weapons because the only rule we had is it couldn't hurt their face and it couldn't kill them. Or it couldn't kill them on camera. I think that was it. But... <laughs> The basic idea was we were constantly struggling with, we didn't have enough information, we didn't have enough stuff, you know, we were all complaining all the time, but it, by the end, it was great. And 59 days later, you know, after eating, I was a vegetarian for 36 years, I had, eat, had to eat a lot of rat, I ate a lot of pigeon. It was good, it was good, it was good. Um, <laughs> rat tastes like pigeon. Um, I don't know what chicken tastes like. But it was really fun, but what was interesting is then it was over. And I had to go back. And it turned out that this, just like my IoT stuff, it turned out that I ended up going back and working on our, our smart city stuff because I ended up making a lot of things like solar trackers and stuff out of junk, and this, which is really, it, it was the maker movement, the beginning of the maker movement. It was so much fun. But what happened is I came back in, in you know, March, and then the TV, they were editing it until August when it was on. And I was like, Wondering, you know, you don't know what they're going to make you look like. Are they going to make you look like an idiot? And um, right before the end, and I'll do a spoiler because uh, my wife was also on the show for a bit. But at the end, I got a call. First, I got a call from the New York Times, and they, I, you know, they wanted to talk about it. And they didn't really tell me much, but I, I was telling them about the importance of making things and, I, and, you know, and working with students. And they said, no, we want to know about the end of the show. And I was like, what do you mean? So... 
long story, I ended up getting asked to go down to the head of my uh, second in command of my company, big company, drove down there. We were supposed to talk for 20 minutes, we talked for an hour and a half. And I was really, really nervous because I didn't know what it was gonna be like. And I was driving home and um, I called one of the other neurotic guys who was in the room. And I was worried because every third word was beep. And, I'm like, oh. and he goes, don't worry about that. As long as you kept your clothes on. <laughs> well, <laughs> day three, I had, um, I had walked outside because it was raining. And all of my, fr my colleagues, my nine colleagues, were catching every raindrop because that was a big deal because we really needed water. I ran out the back door threw off my clothes, and the stink was coming off me because we had been sleeping in the same clothes. We were all sleeping in the same bed. I don't even want to go there. But it was gross. And uh, so I turned around. I was, the stink was coming off of me, and there was a guy with a camera. And I said, you wouldn't. He said, I I'd pick up that plastic if I were you. So I picked up the plastic. That's after I picked up the plastic. Well, we were sitting there. My wife and I were sitting there watching this thing happen, uh, you know, watching it at the same time everybody else was watching it, and that's after I picked up the plastic. Thank goodness for pixelation, but I was like, I was so worried. I thought my career was done. My boss was seeing it, my kids were seeing it, my dogs were seeing it, my parents were seeing it. The second in command of my company was seeing it, and I was so worried. And, you know, when I think about issues like this IoT thing, you know, an AI is like, is it going to kill us? Is it going to... The whole point is you cannot live in that fear. I was so fearful that everything was going to go wrong. It was funny. I went back to work, and people were like, <laughs> they, they thought it was funny. And the next time, six weeks later, I ran into that number two guy in IBM, and I like couldn't even make eye contact. And all he said was, you should get more sun. <laughs> and so, so my, the, the message, and there is a message here, is with this stuff with IoT, and AI in particular, you, and, and the privacy things around it. You know, we could say, no AI, we're not gonna do it. We could go back to the past, because we could worry so much. But the point is, more good is gonna come out of this stuff. More good is gonna come out of autonomous driving, autonomous airplanes, autonomous medical devices. Far more good than bad. Will bad happen? You bet. Now, how are we going to keep that from happening? How are we going to keep Skynet from happening? Because all of us are going to go out there and we're going to inform ourselves. We're going to vote. We're going to learn. We're going to discuss. But we're not going to worry. So I worry a lot. But I always use this slide and I get, don't worry. So be positive, be optimistic, and be careful. All right. That's it.